All right, very good morning. And for any England supporters, I hope you're waking up hangover free. So well done, very much so to, to the boys last night, beating Germany for the first time in a major championship since 1966. Uh, and it didn't even need penalties. And I uh, hasten to say that we all remember what happened back in 1966, but trying to rein in the expectations at the moment and not looking at the uh, projected path to the, to the final too much yet. But uh, yeah, amazing to see that. And, and certainly, I think exactly what the nation has needed um, after what's been a very challenging uh, year or so. So onwards and upwards there and yeah let's get straight into it and talk about what's going on in markets then this morning and a few things for me to get you up to speed on um generally things still relatively quiet a lot of continuation of, of relative trends that meaning that equity markets continue to push to highs again last night so if we're looking at the close the nasdaq was up about a third of one percent seeing some moderate outperformance again against the major other indices like the s p and dow which were basically unchanged um, Nasdaq though continuing to, to kind of lead the charge um, and otherwise uh, obviously from this afternoon from a US data perspective things start to pick up a little bit and obviously the week ends with a bit of a crescendo in the release of the non-farm payroll report so we've got the likes of ADP Chicago PMI this afternoon you've got the Eurozone HICP numbers as well coming out this morning at 10 a.m. So quite a few things now to get our teeth into in what otherwise has been a relatively slow, slow start to the week. Also some updates uh, overnight in Asia and some data. Um, so just quickly cover that before I really go into the charts in a bit more detail on what we're looking at this morning. Uh, and kicking things off then, we had Chinese manufacturing and non-manufacturing PMIs overnight. So these were the state-led ones from the National Bureau of Statistics. Uh, the manufacturing figure came in at 50 spot 9 above the expected 50 spot 8 so basically in line on the non-manufacturing side 53.5 a touch softer than expected 55.3 um, supply chain problems are weighing on manufacturing with the recent computer chip coal and power supply shortages hitting output in some industries is what the nbs said uh, the production sub index and new order sub index for vehicle manufacturing has now as such contracted for two straight consecutive months. Um, the bright spot, however, in that data was the easing in price pressures. Um, this has been a big focal point, of course, in China, where we've had a very large divergence between PPI and, and consumer-led inflation, uh, as both input and output prices of manufacturers fell significantly, suggesting that the government's measures to increase supply of commodities uh, to steady prices is slowly working. Remember, they gave that signal two weeks ago or so, where they were going to um, unlock some of their strategic reserves of certain types of uh, metals, in particular industrial metals, in order to ease some of those price pressures, which seemingly is having some effect at this point. So overall, I wouldn't really look to the Chinese data for too much guidance as towards the European session or the, the US session going forward. Just more of a, a matter of fact that that came out overnight. As far as the open this morning, things are relatively quiet as we look kind of forward. But there's a couple of charts to have a look at. For one, I was just having a look technically in the stock indices at the S&P and the DAX this morning. Um, this is the S&P 500. And this is looking on a 60 minute candlestick chart. And just looking at this trend channel moving on the way up that we've had really over the course of the last several sessions. Um, and we're just coming up to a bit of a pullback from the overnight highs. You can see we really peaked um, yesterday afternoon. Don't forget yesterday afternoon, of course, shortly after we saw the top. Um, that came after consumer confidence in the US obviously jumped to its highest level in nearly one and a half years. Came out considerably stronger than expected at 127.3 against 119. Uh, so continued labor market optimism. Uh, was noted ahead of the reopening of the economy, offsetting any concerns around um, high inflation at this point in time. Came back up uh, towards the highs in the overnight Asia pack session, and we've just drifted as Europe has come in. Don't forget, European players were in the marketplace to have seen yesterday's all time highs. So, seeing a bit of profit taking, you know, it is the last trading day of the month, the quarter, uh, semi annually. So, yeah, I, I don't see too much surprise here for a bit of a pullback. Technically, just looking where we're at at the moment, it is fairly interesting. You've got the pivot here on the, the daily pivot levels, which 
coins coincides with the bottom end of this trend line on the trend channel and also horizontally has been an area of previous resistance to the um, all-time high back on the 28th which has also acted as support to a, to a degree as well um, at the beginning of the week so quite an interesting technical area here a breakdown of that perhaps we could trade a little heavy or is this just enough of that um, kind of profit taking move and now that provides a bit of a flaw given the um, triple kind of technical signals there and then we just continue to respect this upward channel uh, would be something I'd be keeping an eye on uh, in a similar fashion slightly different technical setup but just keeping an eye on downside levels in European indices this is the DAX future and again looking on a 60 minute candlestick and the reason I'm looking at that is if we go back to um, the decline that we saw this was the Bullard inspired kind of sell-off that we had back on the 18th uh, post the hawkish tilt from the Fed which caused that gap down in the DAX future you can see here in the center um, going back then to some of the price action we've had quite a nice um, inflection point here from uh, 15653 in the DAX future and that's just about where we're trading at the moment you can see that previous um, high on the 23rd and the 28th and support area then on Monday and Tuesday of this week so just keeping an eye on that at the moment uh, again this any breakdown here you've got the pivot just below but then range wise not a great deal of support uh, of more clarity until we get much lower down at 15.515 so quite important areas here where as per global indices you know be looking at them the the correlated moves across all of them in order to gauge then timings and momentums if there are any tests and breach of these downside levels uh, otherwise gold was another one I just quickly wanted to comment on because gold I think I saw a stat this morning it's on for one of its worst monthly performances that we've had um, in in multiple years uh, and obviously a, a, a key component of that was the hawkish surprise that we had from the FMC and uh, although the kind of centrists and, and the people that really matter like Powell and Williams continue to hold the line in terms of the rhetoric there's obviously been an increasing chorus of, of hawkish speak from federal officials um, granted they have been for more hawkish minded members but the two rate hike dot plot surprise that we had uh, the more sticky inflation kind of comments and obviously that has um, lifted the greenback of late it's also helped yields um, remain a little bit more elevated in the wake of that and gold has really suffered and so quite key here I've had marked up for, for a long time uh, this kind of colored area here at around 1762 that's where the market found a bit of a turn going back into late November of last year bounced very aggressively off it in February before the breakthrough and then it acted as well as a nice area for price to react off going through April of this year bounced again off it in June and yesterday we broke through that area and we're trading just below on the bottom side of it at the moment and you can see here you've got that April low and the, the, the peak of price action in March April so for me here around this 55 to 62 area is a key zone for gold which if it continues to trade heavy then as you can see technically there's not a lot here to step in the way to see gold prices again roll over and perhaps move down more medium term to 1717 type area which would be obviously another fairly deep move of another 25 30 bucks on the current price from where we're trading at the moment so definitely keen to see on the dailies where we finish and obviously things like non-farm payrolls on Friday um, is going to be quite a key catalyst determining dollar fluctuation which I'll be looking at to determine the, the kind of catalyst and lead off of potential gold movement um, all right let's run through some of the other news stories then and get you up to speed on a few different things um, firstly oil prices uh, yeah a lot of people are waiting now the OPEC meeting but just to cover off one of the first things last night we had the API crude oil inventories and of course this comes ahead of the DOEs this afternoon regular time 3 30 p.m London time release um, didn't really see too much of an initial reaction to this but it did see prices generally slowly climb in Asia pack trade and WTI at the European Open is trading up 39 cents um, at 73.36 last um, and the reason they're here because the API number came in and marked its sixth weekly drawdown in a row 
and much more sizable than market expectations. So a drawdown of 8.153 million against expectations of 4.17. On the flip side, though, gasoline was pretty bearish, sizable build against expectation of a draw, cushing a draw of 1.318. Uh, million. All in all, though, probably the fairly tame response to that is because everyone's really awaiting OPEC, of course. And OPEC and its allies, as you can see here from the title of this article on Bloomberg, have delayed their preliminary talks between ministers by one day to allow countries more time to resolve their differences ahead of what's being seen as quite a crucial meeting for the cartel to make. And this is all according to two delegates. So the JMMC, the Joint Ministerial Monitoring Committee, which was due to meet today, that meeting, at least at this point in time, is going to be taking place on Thursday. Now, Russia, and this is quite key, Russia, who faces less budgetary pressure to sustain higher prices, they, I think, have come as no surprise, are kind of more advocates of wanting to, to pump more, so get a bit of a further loosening of this supply pact agreement, according to people familiar with their oil policy, whereas Saudi Arabia's position is basically they're not aligned with Moscow. And so this isn't the first time this has happened, so it doesn't come as too much of a surprise, to be honest, because in December, a similar split between Riyadh and Moscow caused the group to delay talks by two days, so again, it could roll over until the end of the week. Um, ultimately, though, even back then, they found a compromise agreeing on a modest production increase. And um, my belief is that Saudi cannot do this whole OPEC plus agreement without the Russians. They're going to have to make a concession to keep the Russians happy. So I think the Russians get a little bit more. This is just purely tactical. They'll cause a lot of headache. They'll disagree, disagree, disagree until they extract that concession out of Saudi pump another few hundred thousand. Thank you very much. We move on. The supply pack remains in place. The amount of um, new supply coming to market doesn't shock the market. It's not enough to really um, impede then prices remaining generally where they are at the moment as demand continues to outweigh <clears throat> any new supply coming to the market, in my opinion. All right. Other things to be just mindful of. Um, overnight in Asia, um, there's been continuation of further lockdown measures implemented in Australia. Uh, the Aussie overall, pretty flat overnight, not really a great deal to talk about, but just a uh, continued update on this uh, because Australian officials have extended the lockdown and social distancing uh, measures to more of the country, that including large popular cities like Sydney, Perth, Darwin, Brisbane, and so on. Um, elsewhere, some positive vaccine news. Um, actually and which is good good obviously on a on a humanitarian level and, and obviously it's good if you own moderna shares because they hit all-time high yesterday following some of the news and so just running you through this so first off you had russia's sputnik 5 vaccine is around 90 percent effective against the highly contagious delta variant uh, moderna said its vaccines produce protective antibodies against the delta variant and Johnson & Johnson vaccine has also reported robust immune response to all of the current variants at this point in time. So these are very welcome signs, uh, given the fact that obviously uh, the vaccines remaining effective as the mutations continue to unfold in the period ahead is going to be critical in terms of containing COVID and, and helping the global economy to continue to recover at this point in time. So... Um, this is more, I would say, expected. It's more continuity. The vaccines have always been um, very rigorously tested in order to make sure they are still effective, particularly with new, more transmissible uh, and immune evasive type mutations that are, that are coming. And as long as they are, which is expected to be the case because that has remained that way so far, then we're all good to continue to have this fairly uh, fixed, more optimistic view of an economic recovery at this point in time. Um, another thing I wanted to mention was this. We had some comments overnight from uh, a Fed member who is a voting member called Fed's Waller. Um, and the Reuters headline says a 2022 rate hike is possible once MBS taper first. Um, I, I guess this is just a word of warning, really, because the market hasn't really reacted to those comments the main point I wanted to make was, um, for me, this is a really misleading headline. I mean, you read the headline and you think, what? Rate hike possible in 2022? Now, there are obviously some officials going for that, but 
when you hear it term like that, you can't help but feel that this is quite a hawkish comment. Um, Waller tends to sit fairly centrist, maybe marginally leaning on the hawkish side. So it's a pretty punchy comment. But you then actually read his speech. And this is what he actually said. He actually said uh, the unemployment rate would have to drop fairly substantially or inflation would have to really continue at a very high rate before we would take seriously any rate hike in 2022. So that's a lot more measured than what this headline would suggest. So I just want people to be aware of you know, news agencies are in the business, yes, of reporting news. But obviously, the more clicks that they can generate, well, the better it is for, for them, their activity, their, their kind of KPIs, and you know their, their subscription rates. So you've just got to be a little bit more intelligent and, and, and question these things from time to time. Um, Waller did suggest that there is a lot to decide regarding potential taper, and there is a wide range of views on timing, pace, and sequence. Well, he is in favor of tapering MBS over treasuries. And would like to see tapering before hiking rates. Again, none of that is surprising. I think the general consensus is MBS before treasuries and definitely tapering before rates. So yeah, all in all, I think it's pretty understandable why the market hasn't reacted to this, but just wanted to, to go over that. In terms of the calendar for today, yeah, this morning is pretty quiet. We've had um, the latest UK GDP figures come out. Uh, I'm just going to bring those to you now, just update my news feed. So they came in quarter and quarter minus 1.6 the year on year for Q1 UK GDP minus 6.1%. That is zero surprise. This is very backward looking outdated data nowadays. And so zero reaction in markets as you would anticipate. Very much so looking forward to now the Q2 GDP numbers coming out uh, in the near future. Um, otherwise, this morning is pretty quiet overall. You've got the German unemployment rate and change coming just ahead of 9 a.m. at 8.55. Eurozone HICP flash. Year on year reading expected at 1.9% against previous 2% range, 1.8 to 2.1. And then going into the afternoon, it certainly gets a bit more interesting then where you've got things like US ADP national employment, often seen as the precursor to payrolls. Headline figure expected to moderate slightly back to 600 from the near million last time out. And then the Chicago PMI um, set to do the same for the month of June to fall down to 70, which is still a very robust number from the elevated 75.2 that we saw in May. Um, pending home sale or pending home index sales change coming out at three as well. Um, then you've got the DOEs at 330. Um, speaker wise, Bank of England's Haldane, you can pretty much write off now. Um, he is now outgoing pretty much last days. So what he says really doesn't matter. So if he does come out with something hawkish, it could well just be a, a final departing gift from him being the outlying hawk on the board to just say sayonara to the MPC. So I don't think the market will take anything he says with any type of uh, impact for underlying prices. And in Feds Bostick, who is a voter, is speaking later on at 1 p.m. And that is it. So I'm going to let you guys get on with the day. Um, and if you have any questions at all, feel free to leave a comment on the video if you're watching on YouTube. Or otherwise, I'll see you guys in the Amplify Live community. Thanks very much.